Regent Street is one of London's most prestigious and famous streets, lined with grand and highly decorated Victorian terraces. But it was once more than just a rich shopping destination for international flagship stores. It was, in the 19th century, surrounded by some of the filthiest alleys and courts in West London, and home to some of the capital's poorest residents. The street's construction, completed in 1825, required the demolition of several old roads and numerous buildings. One of these, Swallow Street, still exists from Piccadilly, but has been truncated by Regent Street, with much of its former route heading north towards Oxford Street now beneath properties on Regent Street's west side, though it appears again as Swallow Place and Swallow Passage, just off Oxford Street. John Nash, Regent Street's architect, believed the new road would, de facto, become a dividing line between the upper classes and nobility of Mayfair to its west and the working classes of Soho to its east. Soho had witnessed much decline, and Mayfair streets were fashionable for London's wealthy. Regent Street's central section was designed for tenant shopkeepers of fashion and taste to rival Bond Street and appeal to this rich clientele. The riffraff, butchers and greengrocers who used to make a living in the neighbourhood were not allowed premises. Despite this, behind the façade and in the old streets, shadowy alleys and courts, hidden away from the fashionable ladies and gentlemen shoppers, were many poor and working-class families, living and working in overcrowded, squalid conditions, and suffering wretched poverty. Today, in a contemporary account by a Victorian journalist, we travel behind the handsome façades, carriages and fashionable ladies and gentlemen of Regent Street of the early 1860s to discover what life was like for ordinary Londoners in the streets beyond. Find out how, behind the famous London Street, was to be found a dystopian world of dark alleys, filthy overcrowded hovels and poverty unlike anything the wealthy shoppers on Regent Street could possibly imagine. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. The evils of overcrowding in courts and alleys are, unhappily, not confined to the eastern end of the metropolis. There are almost as many dark holes and corners within a few yards of Regent Street or Charing Cross which shelter almost as much sickness, crime and poverty as any back hiding places in Whitechapel or Bethnal Green. We may have all hurried for years along the bright open highways, scarcely glancing at the little doorways scattered here and there between the busy shops. And yet these doorways... Holes, call them by what name we will, are the entrances to many thousands of closely packed homes. These human dwellings, human and little else but the old familiar house shape, in old central neighbourhoods like St. James's, Westminster, form square openings, reaching up to the little patch of heaven overhead like the shaft of a mine. The air in them is close and heavy, and they are dark on the clearest day. The infants and mothers suffer because they cannot escape from them. The elder children, as soon as they are able to run, desert them from instinct, and find more comfort in the gutters and streets, and the men leave them to seek for warmth and cheerfulness in the neighbouring tavern. They are penal settlements, not homes, and those who visit them and consider the effect they must have on mind and morals, are compelled to wonder that there is not far more vice and drunkenness in the world. The poverty and low living of London have to be largely dug out. The noisy crowds who clamour at police courts, who jam against workhouse doors, like visitors to a theatre, who are foremost at soup kitchens, and other similar charitable distributions, contain very few of the patient, hard-working, Poor, these sit in their wretched rooms, looking into each other's faces, drooping over bare shop boards, bare benches, bare tables, 
and half-empty grates, hoping and praying for work. They only ask to be employed. They tramp through miles of mud. They stand for hours in workroom passages. They bear rain and cold and hunger without murmuring. And they clear their little households of every saleable article rather than beg. When they have got their little strip of cloth or leather to stitch or cut into shape, they clasp it like some precious treasure and hurry home to begin their ill-paid task. In times of plenty they are, perhaps, a little wasteful. They look a very short way into the future, but we must think of their education and habits, and their cheerless lives. It is easy to add up their little excursions, their few dissipations, and fewer amusements, and to bring a wholesale charge of improvidence against them when they drop dead from want. But how few would bear the trial of living where they live, and come out of it prudent, thoughtful, and pure. The great central neighbourhood of St. James's, Westminster, which is a fair sample of many adjacent districts, such as Soho, part of St. Martin's in the Fields, etc., is chiefly occupied in its Berwick Street district by working tailors, porters and shoemakers. Nearly every street has got its history in London handbooks and is famed for having sheltered some celebrity in literature, science or art. Now, however, the mansions fashionable in the last century are let off in tenements. Every room is crowded with a different family, and four, if not more. Landlords are interested in the rent. The leases are invariably sublet, three deep, and the active inspector of nuisances, Mr. J. H. Morgan, has more than enough to do. Dwellings that originally sheltered eight or ten persons are now crowded with thirty, forty, or fifty inmates. The carved wains coatings are torn to pieces, or covered an inch deep with black grease. The old banisters are broken down. The stairs are rugged, dark and uneven, but fortunately broad according to the original plan of the buildings. Garrets are as much crowded as ground floors, and even more because some of these ground floors have been turned into common shops, and one of the worst features of the district is a tendency to live in kitchens and cellars. Nine of these kitchens, wholly unfit for human habitation, were condemned last year. Chiefly in Windmill Street, Haymarket, Pulteney Street and Francis Street, in some cases they are lighted by a small window, looking out into a shallow area half full of stones, oyster shells and dust, and in other cases they are lighted by nothing but a small gridiron grating. In each of these damp, dreary, underground prisons were self-confined a large family, consisting of four, eight or even ten persons and the average rental paid for each room was about three shillings a week. Hundreds of these kitchens are still so occupied, although the district has been weeded of the very worst, and some of the condemned apartments are turned into carpenters' workshops, others into dust holes and receptacles for filth. Looking down more than one of these repulsive places, I saw a shelving heap of dust, broken bricks, egg shells and vegetable refuse. Here it was that cholera spent its chief fury in 1854, and though every house then felt the weight of that affliction in one or other of its rooms, and the gutters ran with chloride of lime for many weeks, the same crowding and dirty habits still prevail. The dirt arises partly from long-settled carelessness about domestic cleanliness, partly from the impossibility of keeping one room tidy when six or eight people have to eat and sleep in it, and partly from the neglect of landlords to whitewash, paint and paper the dwellings. The crowding arises from the desire of the working population to be near their bread, as they express it, and the high rental of the tenements, averaging four shillings a room per week, arises naturally from this rush upon a particular spot. An empty room is a novelty. 
the distribution of population is not equal, even in the same parish, because the rents are unequal. About 134 persons live on an acre in the St. James's Square division, about 262 on an acre in the Golden Square division, and 432 on an acre in the Berwick Street division, the neighbourhood I am dealing with. I went into one of the houses in Pulteney Court within a stone's throw of Regent Street and was struck by its resemblance to one of the lowest dwellings of Bethnal Green. The small yard seemed rotting with damp and dirt. The narrow window of the lower back room was too caked with mud to be seen through, and the kitchen was one of those black holes filled with untold filth and rubbish which the inspector had condemned a twelve-month before. The stench throughout the house, although the front and back doors were wide open, was almost sickening, and when a room door was open this stench came out in gusts. In one apartment I found a family of six persons, flanked by another apartment containing five. One room was a little better furnished than another, but the gloom of poverty, dirt, and foul air hung over all. A turn-up bedstead, dirty and broken, a small cracked table, a couple of rickety chairs, a piece of soap lying on the table by the side of a greasy knife, a pail full of soaking rags, and a knot of sooty infants in a corner seemed to be the usual contents of a room. One thin, sharp-faced boy was minding one of these apartments for the tenants, while they, both husband and wife, were out seeking work. I asked him if he lived there. No, sir, he said. My ass is higher up. He led the way to one of the garrets, where there were more signs of misery still. And this, he told us, was his house. The dead cinders had oozed out of the grate into the room. An empty saucepan stood on the table by the side of a piece of soap. A cracked teacup was on the floor. An old collapsed bedstead, covered with something like a ragged mat, stood in one corner, and the dismal aspect of the place was heightened by two or three flower-pots full of black earth and dry, sapless sticks. The boy's mother was a poor shirt-maker, deserted by her husband, and left, fortunately, with only this one child. In the next garret were a shoemaker and his family, a wife and three children. The room was tidy and even comfortable, though the workbench under the window was idle. The rent of this apartment was three shillings a week, although the low roof had been broken in half a dozen places by the snow. The man, upon being questioned why he lived in such a hole, at such a rent, with a ceiling scarcely higher than his head, spoke about his long residence in the parish, his familiarity with its people and its ways, and his dread of going into another neighbourhood, which he said would be like a foreign country. To him... This dislike of going amongst strangers is the feeling which often keeps up rents and often keeps the working population huddled together and poor. In another room was a consumptive tailor working on a shopboard under the window, faced by his wife, who was also employed in the same trade. One child was playing between them on the board, another on the floor, and five more were in the street. The man was almost bent double with disease and long stooping, and, bad as he was, he was only like hundreds of his class. Seen dimly through the garret windows opposite were many more similar workers, and many garrets in the neighbourhood contain half a dozen yellow, crooked workmen stitching themselves into their graves as they sit cross-legged on the floor. This man was an outdoor patient of the Brompton Hospital, and he held out his letter of recommendation in his long, thin hand. 
The hand, the voice, the hollow chest were quite sufficient credentials of disease without any written attestation. His employment, like that of most of the tailors in this district, comes chiefly from the West End houses, and he has to live in the neighbourhood to be within reach of his masters. He was working painfully on some tough piece of army cloth. In another small street, called New Street, remarkable for its condemned kitchens, was a little broker's shop, which looked miserably bare of stock. An old bedstead and one or two small articles stood at the door, but the interior was empty. The room at the back of the shop, where the owner and his wife lived, with seven children, was also nearly empty, for the bedstead at the door was almost the last of their own domestic furniture. The man was a French polisher out of work, and bit by bit his little home had been broken to pieces and sold to passers-by. It was suggested that an application to the parish was a proper thing under the circumstances, but the wife proudly declined to ask for such charity, saying they were well known in the neighbourhood, and after poor law relief they would never be able to hold up their heads. This is a very common feeling, especially amongst poor ratepayers. The most singular hole and corner in the district is number six, Husband Street. It is a small yard containing a dust bin, a water tank, a couple of lower rooms or cellars that look like condemned cells, and a number of rooms with black wooden exteriors reached by ladders and supplied with rude balconies. The population of each room on each flat can look over into the yard from these balconies, which help in some degree to ventilate the place. Each room is crowded with a distinct family, having many children, and one room contains a mother-in-law in addition to the usual family. In one of the small garrets is an old charwoman, living by herself, who is going into the infirmary in a few days, and in the other garret is a widow with three children who supports herself as a tailoress. Her few goods were seized for rent at her last lodgings, and she was left without a single article of furniture except a few rags for a bed. The children were squatting on the bare boards, and she was standing up stitching a piece of scarlet cloth at the window. One advantage of living in tenements, as it is called, is that the poor come together and help each other, or their lot would often be harder than it is. The miserable lodger who has no fire can often run up or down and sit with the one who is more comfortably situated. And many a hungry mouth is filled, or naked form partly clothed, by those who have little more than a few crumbs to share. The sanitary work of this neighbourhood is perhaps heavier than that of most districts, except the Strand district, certainly far heavier, taking equal areas. The inspector of nuisances is that rare workman, a man whose heart is in his work, and the poor regard him as a friend and adviser. Besides nuisances arising from overcrowding in ordinary dwellings, or courts and alleys, he has to deal with many troublesome animals. The district contains nearly 400 stables, in which are kept more than 1,000 horses. Over these stables are a number of small close rooms, in which about 900 people reside and bring up their families, or one-fortieth part of the whole population of the parish. Another nuisance arises from cows of which there are at least two hundred kept at eight stations in as many streets. I went into one licorice-coloured den, where thirty-nine of these animals were standing with their faces against the wall, being milked. There was no light except a glimmer from one or two murky windows in the roof, and the whole place was ankle-deep in slush. Whether the milk supplied to the neighbourhood from this dark stable is an invigorating fluid or not, I leave the able officer of health, Dr. Lancaster, 
to determine, and, I believe in his reports, he has spoken against the system and its product more than once. Slaughterhouses, belonging to small, struggling butchers in the closest part of the neighbourhood, form another sanitary difficulty, which is only got over by incessant inspection. Something like 1,200 distinct nuisances found and 1,600 abated during the year represent a very low social condition for a small West End district.